Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. It's good to see everyone. Hope everyone had a good week. Welcome to our visitors. Pastor C.B. Brooks used to say, when I'd listen to him, he would say, this is no ordinary day. Amen. This is Sabbath. So it's good to be here. We welcome you. It's good to have each of you. Does anyone have any announcements they'd like to share with the group before I cover a few? First of all, we'd like to welcome Pastor Darrell Bentley and his wife, Ginger. Uh, Casey will provide an introduction for him, but it's good to have you both today. Thank you. Uh, we missed some of our members this week with uh, Blanche and Tim and Gordon, and we just lift our prayers for them this week. We miss you. We love you. We just want you to know that. We have fellowship lunch today. Uh, please stay. Food's always good. It's always a good time. We have a preaching workshop today at 2 o'clock, Pastor Casey. It'll be from 2 to 3.30 after fellowship lunch, so feel free to stay if you'd like to. The prayer meeting is on Tuesday, July 19th, each week at 6 o'clock. Tuesday, July 19th, we'll be covering chapters 45 and 46 of the Desire of Ages. Your comments and questions are always welcome, and you're very encouraged to join we also have Bible study on Thursday, July 21st at Carolyn's home, and they're studying joy. Our memory verse is Romans 12, 13. Everyone's invited to Carolyn's house. That's on Thursday at 11 a.m. We have communion and the ordinance of humility plan and scheduled for this Friday, July the 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Uh, that is always a very humbling and wonderful experience. So please join us if you can. That's this Friday, July 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Pilgrim's Inn still needs food truck, unloaders, and volunteers on the fourth Wednesday of every month from 1.30 till 3 o'clock. This month is Wednesday, July 27th, so please keep that in mind. That concludes our announcements. If anybody has anything else that they'd like to share while we're together. Well, this morning for our praise service, uh, Carolyn is going to do a song for us. But you're going to introduce it, though. I am. That's what I'm about to do. <laughs> In my opinion, this is one of the most beautiful songs that was ever written. It's a Christian hymn that's based on a Swedish traditional melody and a poem that was written by Carl Boberg in Monsteros, Sweden in 1885. It was translated into English by a missionary named Stuart K. Hind, who also added two original verses of his own. Has anybody figured out the song yet? I can remember, you'll get it now. I can remember this beautiful hymn being sung by George Beverly Shea at a Billy Graham crusade when I was a child. You're probably getting close now, aren't you? Yep. How Great Thou Art was ranked second after Amazing Grace on a list of the favorite hymns of all time in a survey by Christianity Today in 2001. I know many of you probably know the words to the song, but in, in order to really enjoy this hymn, I would suggest that you turn to page 86 in our hymnal and follow along as Carolyn plays this beautiful song for our country. Thank you.
Thank you, Carol, and that's beautiful. Let's join together as we come into God's presence this morning by joining in our call to worship as printed in the bulletin. over our lives. We thank you that your favor has no end, but it lasts for our entire lifetimes. Please forgive us for sometimes forgetting that you are intimately acquainted with all of our ways, that you know what concerns us, and you cover us as with a shield. We ask for your guidance so that you might walk, that we might walk fully in your blessing and goodness today. We ask that your face would shine upon us, that you'd open the right doors for our lives and for our loved ones, that you'd close the wrong doors and protect us from those we need to walk away from. Please establish the work of our hands and bring to fulfillment all that you've given us to do in these last days. We pray that you would make our way, our way purposeful and our footsteps firm out of your goodness and love. Please give us a heart of wisdom to hear your voice and make us strong by your huge favor and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll next join together for our opening hymn, which is number seven, The Lord in Zion Reigneth. church budget. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 7 tells us, she went and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. 
We worship the God who makes promises and provides instructions. Our Bible text describes the initiative of a widow after she has experienced a miracle, a room full of jars with oil. She returned to Elisha to express gratitude. Then the prophet spoke these final words to her, live on what is left. These words stand as a promise about the sufficiency of God's provision. She does not have to fear for her future. They are also an instruction not to live on borrowed resources. Previously, her family contracted a huge debt which resulted in painful consequences. Elisha's departing advice was for her to manage wisely. The Lord does not only perform miracles, but he also teaches us how to use our blessings from him. The instruction to live on what is left is much relevant for us today. Across G20 countries, which is a group of 20 of the world's largest economies, it's reported that a quarter of the people did not agree with the statement, before I buy something, I carefully consider whether I can afford it or not. Personal financial management is a major deficiency for our time, bringing disastrous consequences. Believers who have the best intentions to partner in God's mission often do not because their finances are in such a mess. These words are unfortunately a common description of reality. Many do not remember the cause of God and carelessly expend money in holiday amusements and dress and folly. And when there is a call for the advancement of the work and home and foreign missions, they have nothing to give. As we claim his promises daily, let us also be diligent in the management of our resources. Some may be struggling, not because the Lord has not already blessed them, but of their lack of self-discipline and good management. This week, as we worship with our tithes and offerings, let us choose to be better managers of God's resources. It is all of us in response to all of him. Will the deacon please come forward? stand for a privilege of partnering with you and with each other. We also recognize your generosity in each of our lives. Please bless and multiply these tithes and offerings, Lord, for the spreading of your gospel. All praise be to you, our Father and our Keeper. Amen. Amen. Please join me now for our prayer anthem. Our prayer anthem is in the bulletin. We'll uh, join in our garden of prayer. And if you can kneel, please do so.
Father in heaven, we bow before you on this blessed Sabbath morning, thanking you for our many, many blessings. We thank you for your amazing love for each of us, for your goodness to us, for your grace and mercy towards us. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom and opportunity to gather, to praise and worship you this morning. May we never take the freedom and the blessing of this worship towards you lightly or for granted. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of hope, of health, and of healing. We thank you for bringing us each into the family of God here safely this morning. We are honored, Lord, to have been created in your image. Lord, we lift this person here, each person present here today, we lift each person to you. We lift each family represented here this morning to you as well, Lord. We ask that you bless each, be with our families, and surround them with your love, and your grace, and your mercy, and your protection, Lord. Empty us of ourselves this morning and fill us with your love and your spirit of kindness and compassion. We come before you this morning to honor your tremendous sacrifice on our behalf through the giving of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Be with us now as we worship you, Lord, and our worship honor you. May we be humble and reverent in all that we say and do. May we look to you, your Lord, for all power and strength. That we may be what you would have each of us to be. All for your honor and glory. These things we pray in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture reading, we're going to be reading from the book of Jeremiah. If you will turn with me to the 17th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. 17th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. When you find that, if you'll go to verse 24 and stand with me. Verses 24 through 27. And it shall be, if you heed me carefully, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but how of the Sabbath day, to do no work in it, then shall enter the gates of this city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, accompanied by the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin and from the lowland, from the mountains and from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifice, grain offerings, incense, bringing sacrifices of praise to the house of the Lord. But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Thank you. You may be seated. And we ask that the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning. Good morning. I want to say welcome to you all. And um, for those of you who may be visitors and not know who I am, my name is Pastor Casey. I pastor both this church, Rock Hill Adventist Church, and as well the Adventist Church in Monroe, North Carolina. And I just want to welcome you guys here this morning, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. I will not be speaking this morning. I get one weekend off a year. I'm just kidding. It's more than that. And um, actually, the Associate Ministerial for the Carolina Conference, aka one of my bosses, is here today 
and he will be speaking for us. And this Elder Bentley, if you want to go ahead and come up here. Miss Ginger, will you wave? This is his lovely wife, Miss Ginger. They both hail from North Carolina. That's correct, right? You North Carolina too? And they have three children, which they raised partly here in North Carolina and partly in Michigan. Did I get that right? Yes. Two boys, one girl, which I just learned. The youngest boy has recently acquired himself a motorcycle, so pray for them. Please. Yeah. Elder Bentley was a um, chaplain assistant when he served in the Army, basically an armed guard for the chaplain, and served one, one tour in Iraq. He's been to Michigan where he had the, well, my dad had the privilege of working with him, and now I get to have the privilege of working with him as well in pastoral ministry. He and Miss Ginger have been married for 28 years. She doesn't look like she's been married that long, but we, um, we're glad that they have been. Amen. And he enjoys playing guitar and music in general, and you're working on your pilot's license, private pilot's license. Yes. So are you ready to fly us all around yet? I can't do it legally. <laughs> <laughs> we're grateful to have Elder Bentley with us. Do you mind if I pray with you? Please, I would appreciate it. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for Elder Bentley, and I thank you for the privilege of having him here at Rock Hill. Thank you for the wisdom and experience he brings to Scripture, and I just ask that you would cause him to be filled, overflowing with your Holy Spirit, that everything that is said and done today would guide us back to you and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I do have a uh, brief children's story. Uh, Pastor Casey said that occasionally you guys will do a children's story. So I see that we have a few kids here. And young lady, I know you're not a little kid, but I would love to invite you for the young people's story. I think you'll like the story. So if you guys want to come up, and I've got my niece and nephew here. If you guys want to come up, I'd love to share just a, a brief children's story with you. Come on up, I won't pick on you too much. We'll just sit up, is it open? Do they normally do right here on the front pew? Wherever you want, on the front. We'll just have you guys sit on the front pew over here. Come on up, have a seat Come right on. there. I promise I won't bite you. I've had a decent breakfast, so we're all good on that. tell you a story about one of the smartest things I ever did that I've ever done yeah I ever did I have ever done right have you ever done something really smart or at least you thought it was really smart well I had this idea that I thought was just going to be the greatest idea of ideas here's what I did let me get some pictures I want to show you and I know you're going to be able to help me with this. First and foremost, help me to identify what is this? Cow. It's a cow, right? Do you agree? We have, we have a cow, right? And it's, it's a particular breed of cow. Uh, when you see the black and white pattern like this, this is a Holstein cow. Now, I did not grow up around a dairy farm or anything like that. My grandpa had a junkyard. And he wanted to have people come and be able to buy the parts, but when you have cars parked out in a field, what happens to the grass? The grass grows up around it, right? And nobody wants to get parts off of a snaky kind of area, so how do I mow the lawn? How do I mow the junkyard? He used cows to mow the junkyard. <laughs> and you see how big this cow is? Well, it's not the one that I'm gonna tell you the story about, but they ate very well. And it worked. They kept the grass eat down around the vehicles. He tried goats, but goats are crazy. And goats got up on top of the vehicles. They tried eating parts of the vehicle. It takes cow much better. Well, I had this brilliant idea. As I watched old Bessie making her way around the junkyard, here came my smart idea. Are you ready? I thought it would be a great idea to take a ride on Bessie. But I was kind of short. How old are you? Oh, I was 12. So I was just a year older than you, not much taller than you. I've always been kind of short. In fact, one day I stopped growing up and started growing out, so be careful, right? But I was going to ride Bessie. 
But how do I get on top of it? I didn't have a ladder. And, and so I had this other great idea, and I'll show you the next picture. And I'll bring it in a little closer. Obviously, it's a tree. Look and see if you can tell me what kind of tree it is. Apple tree. Now, do you think Bessie liked to eat apples, yes or no? Bessie liked apples. So here was my idea. I thought, and I had my buddy Chris with me. I said, if I can get Bessie underneath one of the low-hanging limbs on that apple tree, I can swing down off of that limb, I can land on Bessie's back, and I can ride off into glory. Great idea, yes or no? Sounds pretty amazing so far, right? So how do we get her there? Well, my buddy Chris, he got a couple of the apples. We used our little pocket knife, cut it open so that she could smell the aroma. He started feeding her little pieces of the apple, and he started backing up to get her underneath the tree. Now, let me lay this down for a second. While he's getting her backed up into the tree, I am perched up in the tree on the limb, kind of like Spider-Man, but not near as cool, okay? So here I am on the limb. I see Bessie coming. I'm being really quiet because the last thing you want to do is scare the cat. She gets closer. She gets closer. He's feeding her the little apple pieces, and she just, oh, well, she's just enjoying them. She gets closer, and finally, she's at just the right spot, and it's time for me to do my thing. I'm going to swing down out of the tree, and she, oh, he had her lined up perfectly. And I swing out of that tree, and I land on Bessie's back. And you know how quiet I was trying to be not to scare her? What do you think landing on her back did? Scared her to death. Now, Bessie was used to having flies, right? And she would use her tail to manage the flies, but all of a sudden, something bigger than a fly was on her back. And I landed on her back. And when I landed on her back, she got afraid. She became very scared and she took off. Now, I didn't have a rope on her. I didn't have a saddle. I had nothing to hold on to. So as Bessie took off, right, she goes this way and I start rolling backwards. Here I go, rolling off the back of Bessie. Now, what did I tell you was what she ate most of the time? She was eating apples right now, but what did she usually eat to keep the junkyard where people could get to the cars? What was she normally eating? Grass. Grass. And you know, when grass is cut, it becomes hay, right? Certain types of grass, they grow it up, they cut it, they bale it up, it becomes hay. Well, all over the junkyard, one of the downsides of having a cow mow your junkyard is she leaves recycled hay all over the place. Are you tracking with me? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Everybody else following what I'm saying. I'm trying to be kosher, we're in church, but there's recycled hay. And as Bessie takes off, and as my legs come up over my head and I roll backwards off of Bessie, praise God, as she took off, she didn't run over my buddy Chris because he's standing there feeding her apples, right? When she took off running, she could have plowed right over him. He gets out of the way as she takes off. I go rolling backwards, and as I land on my back, I land square in the middle of some recycled hay. Praise God, I didn't get stomped on. I didn't break anything. And who knows, maybe the good Lord looking out for a foolish young boy had me fall right where I did so I landed on something soft at least. But what do you think that did for my aroma? Do you think that that's a scent that they would ever make soap out of? What about cologne? Probably not. So here I had to go, I go back to my grandmother's house now, right? I'm in the junkyard, my buddy Chris is just, <laughs> he just laughing at me, he thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Go back to my grandmother's house, she wouldn't even let me come in the house. What have you been doing? Well, of course, I never told her two years later about trying to ride the cow. She just knew that I had fallen in some recycled hay. She made me undress outside, it was awful. I got busted, told to be careful, stay away from that cow. So why do I tell you this story? Well, 
Here's the lesson that I want you to learn today. Are you listening? You listening? Here's the lesson. In your life, there's going to be a lot of things that you can do. Nobody's there to stop you, right? Had there been an adult there, do you think an adult would have stopped me from swinging out of that tree on the back of the cow, yes or no? How many of you think an adult would have stopped me? Let me qualify that. A responsible adult. <laughs> Some adults would have been like, yeah! You know, they would have helped me up into the tree. But a responsible adult would have said, no, that's a bad idea. Okay, there was nobody there to stop me, so was I able to get on the back of the cow? Yeah, I was able to follow through with my great idea. There are going to be things that you guys have the opportunity to do, and there's not going to be anybody there to stop you. And here's the lesson. Are you ready? Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Does that make sense? Just because you can do something, you can get away with it, doesn't mean that you should. I want to encourage you to be smarter than I was. Don't put yourself in needless danger. Don't put yourself where you needlessly can get hurt. Yeah, we want to have fun. You know, your kids you like to run around and jump and play and do all those fun things, and you need that. You need good exercise. You need adventure. You need to use your mind, right? Explore, have good ideas. Be smart. Be smarter than I was. Don't put yourself in needless danger. But there's a promise that we have in Scripture, and it comes from the book of Psalms, and it's one of my favorite Psalms, and it says that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who love and fear him. So if we will give our hearts to Jesus, he will send his angels to protect us. And guess what? When we're about to do something crazy, many times his Holy Spirit will speak to our heart and say, probably shouldn't do that. So I have a question as we close. How many of you would like Jesus to send his Holy Spirit to help you make the best decisions to keep you out of trouble? Yeah, I certainly want that. Would you guys come down here and kneel down with me? I want to pray with you. And I want to ask the Lord to help you have better judgment than I did, okay? So let's kneel down together. Yeah, we fold our hands. Do you know why we fold our hands? We fold our hands so that they don't get busy doing something else. And you know why we close our eyes? So that our eyes don't get distracted by something else. So we can keep our hands and our mind focused on talking to our God. So let's do that. Let's get our hands tied up. Let's close our eyes and let's talk to God. Dear Father God, I thank you so much. That you protected me when I tried to ride old Bessie. Lord, it's a fun story to think back on, but it could have gone very badly. I could have gotten injured. I could have gotten trampled. My buddy Chris could have gotten stomped to death. He could have gotten something broken or maimed. But Lord, you protected two foolish young boys that day, and I thank you for doing so. But Lord, I ask that these young people that are before me, help them to be smarter than I was. Help them to make better decisions than I did. And help them to always remember, just because you can do it, just because you can get away with it, doesn't mean that you should. But Lord, we're asking that you would send your Holy Spirit to give them good judgment. Help them to know when to do something and when to go the other way. And please send your angels to protect them. Keep them safe in all of their play, all of their journeys, their time at school, wherever they find themselves. Send your angels to protect them, I pray in Jesus' holy name. All right, God bless you guys. Thank you for being great listeners. Well, if you want to stand with me for the closing hymn. Sometimes the simple lessons are the best. What do you say? But I did take the time to prepare a sermon, so I think I'm going to let you hear it. Is that okay? Oh, mercy. I, I didn't get a single amen. So, okay, thank you. Help me, help me out, sis. You know, go to all this trouble to, to come and bring a message. I would like to deliver it to you. It is a pleasure. It is a blessing to be with you this morning. Uh, Pastor Casey, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, the opportunity to be able to come and serve your church family. And I want to, if, if I may, I'd like to publicly correct one thing that you said. Can I do that? She said that I'm one of her bosses. I prefer to look at it 
says, I'm one of your supporters. I'm one of the people that has the privilege to come along beside not only Pastor Casey, but all of our pastors and to offer them support. Sure, are there some times when a pastor might need some motivation if they're off track? We all do. I mean, I just told you one of the most embarrassing stories of my life in a public forum, being live streamed somewhere, okay? So I put my stupidity on grand display for you already. Right? There are times when we need some motivation. But I'll tell you, being a pastor can be a very lonely gig. It can be a very lonely occupation. Sometimes you can feel like I'm kind of out there by myself. And what about what am I doing? How do I do this? And the moment you walk in the door as the pastor, there's this expectation that you have all the answers. Newsflash for you, we don't. But guess what? Neither do you. That's why God said in Corinthians chapter 12 that we're supposed to function in what form? As a body. Are you with me, saints? Talk to me. As a body, right? Are you with me? And so the pastor is simply a part of that body. Yes. Has the pastor been given an area of responsibility to oversee the churches? Yes. But we don't have all the answers. But I praise the Lord that we serve a God who does. What do you say? I love James chapter 1, verse 5, where the Lord said, if anyone lacks wisdom, just search on Google. <laughs> well, wait a minute. That's what we do, right? When we lack wisdom, where is usually our first place that we go? Online, right? We search. Let's look and let's see what the collective wisdom of the committee called they has established online. One of the ones that's the funniest to me, have you ever heard of Snopes? If you want to debunk some sort of theory or find out if it's legitimate, you go to Snopes.com. You know what Snopes is? Snopes is a man and woman who have established themselves as the authority to validate things. And everybody quotes Snopes. It's just two people. Could they be wrong? <coughs> Better believe it. We need a greater source of wisdom. That's why we need our God. And I'm glad that in James 1, 5, he promised to give us wisdom when we ask. And it is my prayer that as one of the ministerial team members, that I can depend on God's wisdom and maybe be a blessing to our pastors in the field. What do you say? So I solicit your prayers. I don't have it all figured out. I don't have all the answers. But as you can tell from my children's story, I've learned from a few of my mistakes. And that's where we grow. So why am I here preaching? Well, I had the invitation, but why did I seek invitations? I do not want to be the guy sitting at the conference office making decisions about one of our 206 congregations here in North and South Carolina, and I have no idea what your church is all about. When your name comes up, I'm going to remember that Tom and I both like motorcycles. I know, I, I, it, it just fell into it. We, did, we, just, we just started talking. You know, two guys, it doesn't take long, you start talking about things. But, but, but now I have some faces, right? I'm going to remember that very special, special music of one of my favorite hymns. I want to come each Sabbath to our various churches that I can get to know who you are. Yeah, I know we can't get to know everything, but at least if you hear my name, you'll remember me a little bit. And when I think about your church, I'll have some fond memories and remember you. I want to represent you well, and I can't do that if I don't know who you are. What do you say? So that's why I seek and ask our pastors, can I please, can I come spend the Sabbath with you and your church family? So thank you for putting up with me today. As you may figure out already, I like to get feedback when I preach. I have not come to lecture to the frozen chosen today. I have not come to entertain you. Uh, while I think we can have a good time together, there is joy in serving the Lord. I've not come to entertain you. I've come to talk to you. And in talking, there's conversation. So talk to me a little bit, okay, as we spend time in God's Word. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't know why I'm getting a little scratchy there. Well, let's dive into the Word. What am I talking about today? Well, as you can see from the screens, I'm talking about embracing the character of God. What does that mean? I've been doing a sermon series as I've been traveling around, sharing at the various churches. I've been doing a sermon series for two reasons. Number one, my poor wife has to follow me every Sabbath. How many of you think she would like to hear the same sermon every week? 
In fact, she put me on notice when I stepped into the ministerial department. She said, listen, you're not going to get away with this, preach one sermon or two sermons a year. I need to hear something different every week. Praise God. Hey, listen. But what it does, though, is it keeps me in the word. Right? I'm not just taking one message and microwaving it all year for everybody. So it keeps me in the word and it keeps me focused on being a student of the word. And I love to get the opportunity to share. So it's a blessing. So I've been going through this series and this is really a series on the Ten Commandments. I have heard, maybe you have too, tell me, have you ever heard that the Ten Commandments is merely a transcript of the character of God? How many of you have heard that comment? So if it is the transcript of the character of God, I want to embrace his character. How about you? So this is, now stay with me, this is a sermon about the fourth commandment, but what number is this sermon? Just want you to know, I can count without removing my shoes, okay? So I know the fourth commandment, but what did I do? I started out this series with talking about why God had the authority to command his people and how he was a mighty deliverer. If you'd like to hear the other sermons, they're posted on my Facebook page. You're welcome to check them out or on YouTube. But today, we're going to talk about the blessing of restoration. Let's bow our heads. If you would, please permit me. I just want to ask God to speak through me to give me the words to say. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Loving Father, I keen, am keenly aware that without your help, I don't have anything valuable to share. So Lord, I humbly submit myself to you this morning. Father, I thank you that I could be here with the Rock Hill Church family. And Lord, I just thank you for the warm reception that we've had, the good conversation that we've already enjoyed, been able to worship you in song and giving and story and reading. And now, Father, we want to worship you in your word. So Father, please forgive me where I have failed you. Please empty me of self. Please cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Lord, please let the blood of Jesus wash over me just now. That there would be nothing of Daryl that would shine through, but only Jesus. And Father, I lift up my brothers and sisters. Lord, they're not looking for a word from me today. They need a word from you. So Lord, please speak to your sons and daughters. Speak to your family today. And we thank you, Father, that you are in the business of guiding us in your word. And I thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, anybody tell me today's date? Okay. I just want you to be aware that I also know today's date because of the next slide that I'm about to show you. The slide that I want to show you are about my resolutions. Now, usually, what time of year do we think about making resolutions? January, right? We actually call them New Year's resolutions. Well, I had a little bit of a, a thought, and I thought, well, maybe my resolutions would be more effective if I didn't do them when everybody else was failing. You reckon that would help? Well, well, well maybe it depends on how you structure your resolutions. I'm going to show you my first one. Are you ready? All right. Now, this might be a little different than the types of resolutions you're used to seeing, so just stay with me. Here's my first one. How many of you have resolved that you would like to gain weight? Well, how many people resolve to lose weight and fail? Do you see where I'm going with this? If I simply change my thinking, well, now why don't I already resolve to do what I'm already being successful at? Then maybe my resolutions won't fail. So, first resolution, I resolved to gain 100 pounds. How many of you think I'm on track so far? How many of you think this guy's crazy and he shouldn't be leading anybody? Well, you laughed louder on that one. My goodness. All right, here's the second one. See if I get any better. I resolved to get less sleep. Do I have any night owls here? Anybody who struggles to get themselves to bed on time? Uh, I know some people might be like my beloved wife. You know, it comes a certain time and she's ready. She's just gone, right? Don't care what you're doing. She's ready to pass out. 
For whatever reason, my circadian rhythm, my clock is wired a little bit differently. I would prefer to stay up very late and yeah, I'm going to work hard, right? I, I have a good work ethic. I believe I'm probably almost a workaholic. I might be. I don't know. But it's not that I don't want to work. But it feels like the day, every day, should only have one five o'clock. And it shouldn't say a.m. beside it. Anybody else feel that way? You're more of a night owl? Okay, I got a couple of people that can relate to what I'm saying. So maybe a good resolution is I resolve to get less sleep. I could probably pull that off. So far, I'm not failing in my resolutions. What if I resolve to work more hours? I actually think this one might be a good one to impact society in many cases today. I see work ethic being under attack in our society. Anybody else paying attention and see that? A lot of, a lot of our problems it feels like could be solved if folks were just being productive. But maybe I need to work more hours. With that, maybe I need to resolve to spend less time with my family. How am I doing so far? Good resolutions, bad resolutions. Then he's looking at me like, what is this guy doing? What is wrong with him? Then he, your face is asking the question that countless people have asked. And it still goes unanswered. But I want you to know, church members have survived my ministry. They're still alive. They're still in the church. Resolve to spend less time with my family. So far, are these things that are easy to accomplish? Yes or no? Is the success rate likely to be very high? Absolutely. One last one here. I resolve to grow less spiritually. How hard is that one? Apparently it's very easy. How many Christians actually grow less every year? You want to find some interesting reading? Go dig into some of George Barna's information. He, he's done research of thousands and thousands of Christians and you'll find out the average Christian doesn't read their Bible very much. You'll find out that the average professed so-called Christian doesn't spend very much time in prayer, yet they still call themselves Christians. And of course, what has happened with church attendance? Forget COVID. Even before COVID, right? We can, we can set that aside as a little anomaly for a second. But church attendance was on the decline before COVID. Is that true? Yes or no? Absolutely. In fact, if you look at the percentage over 20 years of people who profess to be Christians, it dropped from 72% in the U.S. And I'd have to go back and look at the exact dates, but as late as so 2015 was the most recent that I looked at. So back up 20 years from that. But in 20 years later, it was down to less than 50%. People who even profess to be Christians. So number five, totally accomplishable, right? Totally doable. That's a resolution that I could make work. But should I? What was the lesson from the children's story? Does anybody remember it? Thank you, my dear. Just because I can do something doesn't mean that I should. Well, let me turn these around. Let's fix this. This, it's been troubling my sister here. I know she wants me to fix it. Say, say yes, please. I, just, I, she was like, oh, what is he doing? What if I resolve to lose 100 pounds? Can I give you a testimony? As of this past Friday, I'm down 68 and a half pounds. Praise God. I say it to give glory to my God. Not to me, because listen, I just turned 48, June 5th. And so for 48 years, I had zero real, I mean, I was in the army. Of course, you have to do certain things to maintain weight standards and all that for the military. But when there wasn't somebody standing over me almost literally with a gun, I was out of control. Doing what I wanted to do. My wife and I determined, listen, it's time to get help. So we started partnering with a health coach to give us ideas, to hold us accountable, to get us on the right plan. And I'm walking, you can't see it. I have a brace under my sock. I'm here to tell you exercise will kill you, but you need it. <laughs> started going to the gym four days a week, been trying to do some cardio and some light jogging and got a little bit of tendonitis. But after you've been sedentary for 20 years, 
Is the body going to groan a little bit as you try to come out of that? I'm telling you, God can give us victory even over the body. This suit, I wear it as a testimony. In January, I could have done a quick one of those and sent that button all the way back to Tom. God can help us. I have resolved to get at least seven hours of sleep. I say, well, how do you do that? It's real simple. Go lay down. <laughs> Set your phone aside. Right? Turn off the TV. Be disciplined. But here's the key. Who wants to help us? But many times we don't turn to them and ask them for help. Our Lord Jesus what about working? Well, listen, I have a good work ethic. I'm not afraid of work. I had a friend of mine tell me one time, I'm not afraid of work at all. I can stand and watch it all day. That's not the kind of work ethic I'm talking about, right? I, I enjoy what I get to do. I love serving our pastors. I love serving. Yes or no? Does God expect us to kill ourselves working for him? Now you do your work, be smart, but be in a position where you're willing to let God control that. What about resolving to actually spend some quality time with my family? Ginger has put up with me for 28 years in marriage, but we actually met in the ninth grade. We had one class together government and economics class. So we met when we were 14 years old. No, we didn't get married right then. We waited until we were out of high school, two years. I was 20 and she was 19. That scare you to death, think about a 19 to 20 year old getting married, but we did it. And by God's grace, we're still together. And if we were Catholic, she'd be a saint twice over. Praise God, but I need to spend that quality time with my wife, yes or no? If you still have little ones in your life, you need to spend quality time with them. That was a lesson that I wished I had learned a little quicker when I got into pastoral ministry. I was so gung-ho, I didn't give it to God all the time. But you know what? I also want to grow deeper spiritually. So I'm thankful that my wife challenged me, don't feed me the same sermon every week. I want to be fed too. And she deserves to be fed. What do you say? Just as you do. Just as I do. So these are my resolutions. And saints, I'm not trying to parade myself or tell you how great I am. I'm telling you, I'm a foolish man who tried to ride a cow. And sometimes I still try to ride cows in a little different way. Enough to come along and tap me on the shoulder and say, that's ridiculous. Do something better. God can help us. But why, why do we get entrenched in these, in these habits? Why do we get entrenched in certain behaviors? And I'll tell you, do we as Seventh-day Adventists know anything about the health message? Oh, thank God. I was going to say, I think my mic stopped working. Now listen, I'm not here to beat anybody up on their diet. Um, you know, you... Do what you feel God leading you to do. But I will tell you this. Scripture has told you and scripture has told me that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Know you not, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Does scripture testify to that, yes or no? Yes. Does God need a temple as big as I have provided? <laughs> What's the question? Why do we get so entrenched in our own ideas? And why do we persist in self-destructive behavior when we have clear evidence to show us a better way? Why? It's the timeless question, right? It's almost that existential question. Why would That healthcare industry workers sometimes are 
Do you think that the same thing could be true spiritually? Yes or no? Oh, saints, I, I put you to sleep already. My, my words have been verbal anesthesia. I have put you to sleep. Are you still with me? Yes. So is it possible for those who have the greatest spiritual knowledge to perhaps fall into doing the least amount of with it? Was that true with the Jews of old? Were they not the holders of the oracles of God? Did they not have more revelation? Fast forward. You know more about Daniel's prophecies than Daniel. Is that a fair statement? Yes or no? You and I know more about revelation than John the Revelator. John saw this, this, this thing happening in front of him, and he had no idea how to describe it. He borrowed from Old Testament imagery. That's why the book of Revelation is just replete with Old Testament imagery. He's trying, how do I, how do I quantify this? How do I describe it? How do I make sense of what I'm seeing? I got a lamb with all these eyes. I'm seeing Jesus. When he saw Jesus, what was John's reaction? Did he not fall down afraid? Did not in Revelation 1, Jesus had to come up and put his hand on him and say, be, be not afraid? He didn't know what he was seeing. You and I now know more about the book of Revelation than John the Revelator. What have we done with it? What have you done with it? And saints, I'm here to tell you, Pastor Casey didn't call me and say, now you come over here to this Rock Hill Church and you just whip them silly today. So that, please know that's not my goal. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm saying things to you that I'm also saying to me. Is that fair, yes or no? I'm just asking the question in general, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, with what we know, are we doing enough with it? Are we sharing with enough people? Will there be people who go to Christless graves? Because you and I haven't had the courage to share the wealth of Scripture that we've been given. reminds me of this picture. I came across this picture years ago. See the man standing in the house on fire? Is there somebody there to help him? Somebody who appears to be qualified. Somebody who seems to have the tools necessary to affect the rescue. What's the man's reaction? When you cross your arms, what is that? And, and Tom, your arms are crossed. I'm not picking on you, but just know I am paying attention. But I'm saying in general terms, when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody and someone crosses their arms, many times that's a statement of I'm closing you off. You're not getting past this guard. You can talk all you want. That's why I want to make sure Tom knew I was just, I wasn't picking on him. But what is this guy doing? Is he open to the rescue? How many times does Jesus want to rescue us? Does he want to restore us? Does he want to heal us? Does he want to take us to the next level spiritually? And we stand there. We've got it all figured out. I know it all. I remember my first pastoral district, Pastor Casey. We were planning a series. We were going to do some public evangelism. And I had one of the saints come to me. This gentleman came to me and he said... Pastor, I've heard this all my life. I'm tired of hearing about it. Brand new pastor. How encouraged was I? But the Lord gave me something to say. And I said, oh, well, you must really know how to preach it. Why don't you do the series for us? You've heard it more than I have. You should be the one speaking for the series. What do you think his reaction was? Well, pastor, how could I come support the meetings for you? All of a sudden, right, when it came time, I've heard it all my life, but what have you done with it? He was in a posture of defensiveness and rejection, but he wasn't doing anything with the gift he professed to know so much about. Friends, I don't know about you, but I don't want Jesus on my ladder trying to save me. And all I would rather do is stay there in my defiance and stupidity. How about you? Could it be 
Why do we persist in this attitude? Could it be that sin causes us to have a defiant spirit and naturally rebel against anything that threatens our sovereignty? This plays out in the news. How many times do you hear someone accused, oh, well, where was God? Where was God? I want to grow back in. Amen? And God's willing to help me when I lay down my defiant spirit. It's very easy to get wrapped up in these types of spirits. And I'm, I'm not here. I have had so many failures because of this type of. It's this spirit of defiance. And we find out, here's, here, here should be a comforting fact. Ecclesiastes that there is how much that is new under the sun. Yeah. Not a thing. So guess what? Defiant spirit, old news. Rebellious heart, old news. You're not the first. And sadly, unless Jesus comes today, you won't be the last. God's people, unfortunately, have a long history of being stubborn and rebellious. The Old Testament especially is replete with the roller coaster experience, right? They have a season where one, one leader calls them to uh, accountability, one leader calls them to commitment, and they make that commitment. Uh, think back to Josiah, think back to Elijah on Carmel. Right There's different seasons that we can point to where God's people had highs, and then you remember somebody like Manasseh prior to conversion, right? What did he do? Did he lift up God's people, or did he take them to the lowest depths, right? So there's this roller coaster. If, if you charted the spiritual progress of the children of Israel, it was filled with highs and lows. So this is nothing new, but it begs the question, why? Why do we come persist in it? Notice what the Lord said in Ezekiel chapter 12. Now, I will have some scriptures on the screen, but there'll be some I want to draw you to in your Bible. So have your Bible handy too. But notice Ezekiel 12, 11 tells Ezekiel, say, I am assigned to you. As I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall be carried away into captivity. You see, God's people experienced seasons of captivity. One of them, I can take you back to the Egyptian kingdom. Do you remember how many years they were in captivity under the Egyptians? 400 and some years, right? I mean, you had a long span of time that they were in captivity. They were rebellious. They were led away because of their actions, because of their failure to follow God as he had asked them to do. Now, one of those got brought out in our scripture reading. And Ms. Pat, thank you for reading for us today. Really appreciated that. And notice, I'll take you back to part of that. This is the last part of what she read for the scriptures, part B of the verse. God said, I will kindle a fire in its gates. Now, this is a reference back to Jerusalem. Okay. I will devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And what about that fire? Is anybody able to put it out? No, he says it will not be quenched. In other words, once it starts, she's a goner. Right? She's done for. It's over. Now, what was the issue? that brought about the burning, the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I'm not talking about A.D. Because we know, because you have to specify, right? You say, well, which, which destruction of Jerusalem? I'm not, I'm not talking about A.D. 70. Okay, I'm not talking about after Christ. I'm talking about back in Babylonian days. What brought about this destruction? What were they doing? It's very simple. It's apostasy. Let's look at specifically what it was. 
What had they done that caused God to respond in such a way that allowed his city to be destroyed by invading heathens? It's pointed out in scripture. If you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as, and he gives an example, of course, not carrying a burden when entering. Now, he's not talking, is God being legalistic? Well, listen, you can't carry anything because, unfortunately, in the time of Christ and even nowadays, a lot of Jews will tell you, hey, you can't carry a certain amount of weight or you're breaking this section of Scripture. Right? They'll say you can't kindle a fire. Some of them take it so literally that you can't even flip on a light switch because of the little electrical spark that takes place across the, the, the contact terminals. Okay? It's not what God's talking about. God's talking about them bringing in their wares and they're going on with free trade and commerce. Okay? He says, remember the Sabbath day to do what? We know this, right? We, after all, we're Seventh-day Adventists. We had a plumber had to come out to the house yesterday, help with something. We've got one of these tankless water heaters that's got its own mind all of a sudden. Guy comes out and he finds out I'm a pastor. I had to leave and go do something. So Ginger's there and she ends up basically giving him an on-the-spot Bible study of what is a Seventh-day Adventist? What does your name mean? Well, of all people, we should know about this commandment, yes or no? Yes. We should have this down pat. Six days you shall labor and do whose work? I used to work for my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, sister-in-law, still work for him. Corey, one day I was talking to Phil, and I was complaining that he wanted me to work so many Sundays. He looks over at me and he says, well, I thought you were a Bible-believing Christian. Well, now he's attacked my spirituality. I said, well, I am a Bible-believing Christian. What do you mean? He said, well, the last time I read the commandment, it said six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. <laughs> did, did I have any recourse on the argument? The scripture, and he used it, right? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And, and we won't take time to go through it, but it talks about no work and, and people in your gates. And listen, we understand all of that means the things that are in your control, right? Somebody doing something that's out of your control, God's not holding you accountable for that. And then he gives us the reason why. Why can he command us this? Basically, I'm your creator. I created you. Known to be faithful, yes or no? This guy got thrown into a den of lions. He was so willing. Junk hole. Who asked to go back was a man by the name of Nehemiah. Can you tell me what Nehemiah was doing prior to? Yes, ma'am. He was the cupbearer. So what's the cupbearer? This is, a, this is an amazing job. You get to test the king's food to see if it's been poisoned before he eats it. That sounds like a sweet gig, right? Where do I sign up for that? I mean, you get to try some really good stuff, but it may kill you. That's what he's doing. But word comes to him. All of that information makes its way to Nehemiah. He requests to be able to go back to Jerusalem. And as he comes back, he is established as the foreman, the one who is going to bring about reform in God's people. And they get to work 
I'm going to tell you, I would have loved to have seen how they mounted the construction project to redo those walls. Even to the point that some of them while they were working, I'm not going to threaten anybody, I'm going to get out my pocket knife, but some of them while they're working, in one hand they've got their sword, in the other they're building the wall. Was that some serious opposition to rebuilding the walls? And then some of them weren't walking building at all, they just stood guard. But others, one hand had their sword, the other they're doing their building tools. But Nehemiah stuck with it. God bless them. They got the walls rebuilt in record time, but there were other issues. You see, friends, why were they in captivity to start with? They were 70 years in Babylonian captivity. A generation is genuinely, genuinely considered to start every 20 years. So 70 years, you've got three and a half generations of people that had time to forget what life was like back in Jerusalem. Build, God blesses, they go under adverse conditions, God continues to bless them, finally things are restored, but then there's an issue and Nehemiah brings it to their attention. Notice what he says, Nehemiah 13, 15. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves, probably bales of wheat, right? Bundles of wheat or other grain, whatever bringing in sheaves, loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, right? So when it says back in Jeremiah, bringing in burdens on the Sabbath, notice the same usage is tied to commerce, okay? Which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre, dwelt there also who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath. Does this sound like a very active and busy market? Yes. Everything's going on, right? This is like your farmer's market galore, Eastern market. But then notice what he does, middle of the sentence, middle of the paragraph rather. I contended with who? Contended with the nobles. Why would he contend with the nobles? Who would have been in charge of the families living and now occupying Jerusalem? The nobles, right? When you hear the word nobles, think of those who are the elders among each group or class of people. So in other words, I contended with their leaders, the people who should have been drawing them back to God. I went and talked to them. Here's a lesson from Matthew 18. If you have an issue with somebody, should you post it on Twitter and Facebook or Instagram or should you go talk to the person like Scripture says? Scripture had it figured out. He went and talked to them and he said to them, What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Now notice he reminds them. He goes back now and draws some history to them. Did not your fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by doing what, saints? Feigning the Sabbath. So what was happening? The nation had forgotten how they became captives in the first place. You remember a quote perhaps from Spirit of Prophecy. Now I'll paraphrase it. I don't remember it word for word. Forgive me, but I believe it goes something like this. The only thing we have to fear for the future is to forget how God has led his people in the past. Anybody heard that script? I, mean, I know I'm paraphrasing, forgive me, I don't have it word for word, but the idea is I don't have to worry about where I'm going as long as I don't forget where we've been, right? What had they done? They had forgotten where they'd been. They'd forgotten why they grew up in Babylon. They forgot Nehemiah, he was the cupbearer, but he wasn't in Babylon. He was over in what is now modern day Iran, okay? So they guys were scattered a long ways from home. They forgot what had happened. They had allowed God's standards to fade or disappear altogether while in Babylonian captivity. And friends, without biblical standards, they simply followed the ways of the world around them. Aren't you glad that doesn't happen in the church today? 
Does it happen? You know the trend that I've seen, and I, didn't, I wasn't raised Seventh-day Adventist. I was basically raised heathen. You know, we didn't go to church unless you died or got married. You know, we basically had a basic belief that God existed, but we weren't Christians of any 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 measure. Um, but I, I remember, you know, as I came into the church, I've only been a member since '92. I was baptized March 13th of '92. I remember my spiritual birthday. And just in the short time I've been in the church, I've watched a pattern. You know, the world keeps lowering their standards. And sometimes we feel like as the church, as long as we're just a little higher than the world, we're okay. Right, the world, world keeps going down. Is the world going to get better? Or is it just gonna to continue to devolve into, eventually it'll be as it was in the days of Noah when the thoughts of men's hearts were only what? evil continually, right? But we, we seem to be comfortable with as long as the church's standards stay a little bit above where the world's are, we're okay. Friends, I'm here to tell you, you and I serve a God who says, I am the same today, yesterday, and forever. And I can't buy into this idea that the biblical standards don't matter. Now, please don't get it in your head. Well, this guy, here he goes. He's just launched into some sort of legalism. Put that aside. That really wasn't a request. Because I'm here to tell you, I'm not a legalist, and I'm going to show you as we finish. Okay? So stay with me. Don't tune me out because you think, oh, he's going on some sort of legalistic tirade. That's not where I'm headed. So hang with me, okay? But I believe forgetting what God asked of them, forgetting how to live for God, forgetting how to honor him with their lives, they forgot biblical standards, and it led them to trampling or profaning the Lord's Sabbath. Okay? It's a cause and effect. Why did I fall off the back of a cow? Did I magically just fly out of the air and land on the cow? Or did I take intentional steps to climb up a tree, swing down off of the limb of an apple tree, and I landed on the back of a cow? Thus, I fell off a cow. Friends, everything has cause and effect. I forget which law of physics it is, or Newton's laws of motion, but for every action, there is an equal but opposite Reaction. Anybody heard of that? Okay. It's always the case, though, that the Lord has had a faithful remnant. Elijah thought he was the last one, but how many did God have that had not bowed their knee to Baal? 7,000. God always has those. Nehemiah stepped up and he took a very strong stance. Now, notice his stance. It's a little shocking. Nehemiah 13, 21. He says, I warned them. You've been talking to the nobles, right? Are you still with me? So the them now is a reference back to the nobles. I warned the nobles and I said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? Well, now he's specifically addressing those merchants, those who have gathered to bring in goods. He's already told them to go away, but now they're camped out. So he's talked to the nobles. He's now talking to the merchants. If you do so again, if you show up here next Sabbath, what will be my reaction? Arrest them. I don't hear it that I don't hear it quite like that. When I say I'm gonna lay hands on you, and I'm not about to ordain you or anoint you, is that a physical threat? I mean the police can arrest you, you know. I know sometimes they get accused of being brutal. I don't think that characterizes all law enforcement. North, I think we should allow it to be. Those who do abuse their power should be held accountable. He says, I'm going to lay hands on you. He is threatening them with physical violence. I'm going to drag you out of here, and you're not going to be happy about it. How strong was he in his willingness to defend biblical standards? What do you think he would be called if he were functioning in the church today? Huh? A legalistic person? Yeah, it could be. You can re read the rest of the story. They were also intermarrying with other ethnic groups, and they had been forbidden to intermarry with other ethnic groups. You read that part of the story, Pastor. That, that part will blow your mind. He goes to them, and he says, I pulled out their hair. You're marrying who? 
Can you imagine jerking out somebody's hair? This brother was hardcore. He was serious. Now, am I promoting that we should have a Nehemiah force in every church? So please don't leave here. Well, that Elder Bentley came down and he said we should go around yanking people's hair out and punching them in the face if they work on Sabbath. I did not say that. I'm just trying to show you there was somebody historically who took it so seriously that they felt like it was better to resort to physical violence than to see somebody lost or to trample on God's standards. The saints, I'm not promoting violence towards people. Okay, I'm just trying to help you see in Nehemiah's eyes, it was much, much, much more offensive to trample on the God of heaven than for you to endure a little piece of physical violence. He took it seriously. But how did buying and selling profane the Sabbath? Let's cover this quickly. I would suggest that it violates the three principles placed within the Sabbath. What are they? We'll review them real quickly. Genesis 2, 1 through 3, we see that all the work is finished. Seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And then what was the first thing he did? He rested, right? Did God rest because he was tired or was he simply ceasing from his labor of creativity? Right? He was just setting aside that creative work and then setting an example for us, all right? And notice it matches up with the commandments. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, and then you rest. Why? Because he blessed the seventh day and sanctified. Well, did, can't God bless every day? Have you heard people say that one? Well, well, can't God bless me on a Monday? Sure he can. Can't God bless me on a Wednesday? Of course he can. But what he's saying is, is he's put a special blessing on the Sabbath that he wants us to receive when we've set aside our work and we're communing with our God. I want that blessing. And the last part, it says he's sanctified. And of course, sanctified is just one of those fancy words that means set apart for a holy or set apart for God's purposes. So what are the three principles? Resting from your usual labors, right? We'll just put them on the screen here. He rested, he ceased from his creative work. Number two, he blessed. He placed a special blessing for those who rest from their usual labors on the Sabbath. And God sanctified. He set apart the Sabbath for holy purposes and for communing with him. Friends, if I'm just engaged in buying and selling, but that's what I do through the week, am I resting from my usual labors? It's pretty simple. That's why I love it. Pastor Casey, people come to me, baptizing people, you're preparing them. They say, well, tell me, now I know about the Sabbath. Now give me a list of what I can do. People like their little check sheets, right? What, what can I do? I don't have to teach you what to do. I don't have to hold your hand. All I have to do is make sure you understand the three principles that govern the Sabbath, and the Holy Spirit will guide you in how you should worship on Sabbath. Is that fair, yes or no? Just ask the question, is what I'm about to do resting from my labors? I had a lady one time told me, she said, Pastor, I love to do gardening. For me, it's not labor. It's not work. I'm communing in nature. She had to process that. I prayed with her about it. I didn't try to fuss at her. Didn't try. You need to do this. I didn't try to shake my finger legalistically at her. I just helped her work through the principles. Buying and selling. This is the one from the example. So that's why I'm sticking with it, right? It was in Jeremiah. Now it's mentioned in Nehemiah. So I'm just sticking with that one. But can God bless me when I'm doing something he's told me not to do? Very simple. Does buying and selling and doing my usual labors on Sabbath, does that add to God's holy purpose or does that further me in my communion with God? No. You see, friends, it's very simple. But when the Israelites allowed the Sabbath to become a day of normal commerce, they violated each of these divinely established principles and it set them up for failure spiritually. Nehemiah recognized this and did what was necessary to restore honor to God's holy day. But to the people's credit, now I love this part. I don't want to I don't want to call out what they did wrongly and not tell you how I see that they embraced it. Did they argue with Nehemiah? 
Do you have any record? Go and read it for yourself this afternoon if, you, if you're if you not familiar with the story. You'll not find anything where they say to Nehemiah, listen, who are you? You were a guy taste testing poison 20 minutes ago. Who are you? No, they respected him as a leader that God had established. You don't find them arguing and saying, no, we're not going to do that. You don't find them arguing. They're, they're, you know, they're working through which families are going to do the wall and making sure everybody takes their peace. I'm sure not everything went smoothly every day. I'm sure somebody dropped a stone or something else on somebody else or took from somebody else's pile. I'm sure there were problems. But you don't find an open spirit of rebellion to say, you know what? You're crazy, poison guy. You're crazy, cupbearer. Get out of here. We see them embracing reform. They supported the reforms that the Lord used Nehemiah to bring about. To bring this to an end. For me, I think the best way is always to look at Jesus' example. Can you do anything better? You remember a few years ago, there were these shirts and bracelets and everything else. WWJD. All right, you remember those? What would Jesus do? I, I, I like something a little bit better. I don't have to ask what would Jesus do. I can read scripture and I can say what did Jesus do? I don't have to guess. What did he do? What was Jesus' practice as it related to Sabbath? Went to church. His version of church. What did they call church in Jesus' day? Synagogue. Synagogue. Right? You had one temple, but not everybody lived near the temple, right? Not everybody could come there, so they had these community centers. It's, it's honestly kind of built along the same model as what you might see as, as Islamic centers of worship, right? Where they have mosques. And the mosques that uh, Muslims use nowadays, they're not just places of worship that they do on Friday afternoon. I just came by a, a big one in Charlotte yesterday, and there were literally hundreds of cars coming out of this huge Islamic center, but they also have community meetings there. They have various teaching and work, uh, different things, right? So they're community centers. The synagogues in Jesus' day were the same way. What did Jesus do? Well, Jesus went into the synagogue each Sabbath. The Bible says it was his custom to do so. We see that the disciples, they labored each week. I remember when I first heard a public evangelistic series. Anybody ever heard of Elder Del Pollitt? He was the conference evangelist for a number of years. I remember him standing up there and he had $1,000 cash. I'll give this $1,000 to anybody who can show me where the Sabbath was changed in Scripture. How safe was his money? He knew there was not a chance anybody was going to get that money. Why? Because there's not a single verse in Scripture that talks about the Sabbath ever being changed. The disciples knew that. The disciples honored that. They followed what Jesus had done. And the Sabbath is the only day upon which Jesus has placed his direct lordship. And I'll just flash them on the screen. You're familiar with these, right? The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark, three of the four Gospels declare this. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 6, 5, he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Friends, Jesus worshiped on Sabbath. He placed his lordship there. His followers embraced it. Now look at this last statement on the screen. I would say that most Adventist Christians do not question the truth about the seventh day Sabbath. Can you agree with that, yes or no? Uh, and, and, and many Adventists could even defend and teach the Sabbath and call you to scriptures. I, I, I haven't even begun to touch on the scriptures that we could use to say, hey, here's the Sabbath, right? There's hundreds of things we could look at. But how many struggle with whether or not they will honor the Sabbath? Maybe you have lived in some areas where that has been a struggle. I've been in a few situations that because I was not willing to do certain things on the Sabbath, I was looked at as the weirdo. Things that were, in my opinion, and biblically examples given, are not in harmony with God's teaching. Many have no issue with the Sabbath and fully submit to God in this area and they enjoy his promised blessings. Saints, I can tell you, 
based on my resolution number five that I put on the screen to start out with, I want to be in this camp. I want to be surrendered to God, embrace his Sabbath, and just do what he's asked me to do. How about you? I don't want to argue with God. I'm not smarter than God. I'm probably not smarter than most anybody in this room, let alone God. I just want to be in harmony and enjoy his promised blessings. But some might be like the believers in Nehemiah's time. Maybe they have spent a little too much time in Babylon and adapted some Babylonian ways. Well, this is what the world does. So as long as the world does it and I keep my standard a little higher than the world, am I okay? It's what we convince ourselves. As a result, we may have forgotten what God commanded us to do and we miss out on his promise of special rest, special blessing, and the joy of advancing his Is your life so rich that you don't need God's blessings? How many say, God, I'm, I'm you would say, I have no joy in in God's holy purposes. I can tell you it's kind of a two-edged sword for me. My greatest friend Because they don't really care about the Sabbath. But the profaning, but profaning the Sabbath is not something the Lord looks upon lightly or will simply ignore. Notice this, Numbers 15, and I've pieced together parts of verses 32 and 35, so go read the whole thing if you want to get all the details. But basically, they found a man, he was gathering sticks on the Sabbath, they sequestered him, they put him under guard, they came to Moses and they said, hey, what do we do with him? Moses goes to the Lord, notice what God says to him. So this next part right there where it says, then the Lord said, this is God talking, right? Moses is asking, now God speaks and he says, surely the man should be what? The saints, if you thought Nehemiah was hardcore, where did he learn it? Saints again, or, well, Elder Bentley, are you saying that we should each each nominating committee season that we should select a stoning committee? <laughs> no, you wouldn't have to select a committee because it was everybody. Can you imagine, Saints today? And since I talked to Tom the most, I'm gonna pick on Tom again. <laughs> Can I pick on you again, Tom? Sure. Thank you. I've got public permission. You heard it, Saints today. You know how crazy Tom's been out buying and selling his motorcycles on Sabbath and whatever else he does. So we're going to have to take him out back and stone him. Saints, I'm not trying to be coy or, or, or put what God has said too lightheartedly. I'm simply trying to say what would it look like if that same standard was applied today if we truly understood just how seriously God takes his commandments. Because we may not take somebody out back and stone them, but I'm here to tell you there's a day coming where God is going to remedy sin in a final sense. Now, I love that I have two options. I can have the remedy for sin right now. Somebody should have said amen. Can I have the remedy for sin right now? This is one remedy for sin. Revelation 20 calls it the second death. What's the other remedy for sin that helps me avoid this one? Jesus. You see, friends, that's what it's all about. This is not about some checkbox religion where I'm trying to live by the letter of the law and, and I'm afraid to even go walk in the water because I'll violate the Sabbath. 
There's something that I read in Galatians chapter 5 that the Holy Spirit wants to give me. And it starts with a J and ends with a Y. Can anybody guess what it is? Joy. God does not want the Sabbath to bring misery. Praise God. He wants me to have joy in worshiping him. But he also wants me to set self aside and make it about him, not about me. So is keeping the Sabbath what we do to be saved? It's quite the opposite, right? We should keep the Sabbath because we are saved. We should keep the Sabbath like God has asked us to do because we love Jesus more than we love ourselves. Saints, it has to be a love response. It must be our reaction to the love that Jesus has already poured out to me. And I don't know about you, but when I read this, I have to ask myself, do I really love Jesus? And I'm not trying to be smart alecky here, but if I really love Jesus, how would that be reflected in my life? If I tell you that I love my wife and she shows up to work with two black eyes, do I really love my wife? Talk to me, saints. If I give my wife two black eyes, is that an expression of love or is that an expression of abuse? And I'll tell you, there's something I have zero respect for, and that's a wife beater and a child abuser. Don't put up with it. If you see people being abused in your life, stand up for them. Amen? Speak up for them. And sweetheart, please publicly testify that I've never given you a black eye. Even though when we got married or were getting married, we had one of those wedding showers and somebody gave her a big wooden rolling pin and she was instructed to use it on me. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? She's never had to use it. Praise God. Yeah. We still have Come on now, brother. Have a little faith. <laughs> but it's a love response. I can't say that I love her and then treat her like garbage. I can't say I love my children and then trample on them or beat my children or molest them or something else. Are you with me? Love is not manifest in hurt. And love for my God is not manifest in remaining in sin and living how I want to. Love for God is manifest in surrender. You see, it comes down to a test of loyalty. And Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. I love that the Bible tells us that if we're going to count it among God's faithful in the last days, then we too must be like Nehemiah, not laying hands on people and pulling their hair out, but being willing to stand up publicly and profess our allegiance to God. I love this last verse, Revelation 13, 3, and a piece together 15 with it. You can read the context for yourself. But all the world marveled and followed the beast, but he, God, will cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Excuse me, he's not God there. It's uh, the beast power, the devil. Are you a threat to the kingdom of Satan? Or are you a non-issue? Do I have any military veterans? Okay, thank you gentlemen for your service. Appreciate you. you do you worry about something that's not a threat? You focus where the threat is, right? The devil does the same thing. And here's my question to you. Are you a threat to the kingdom of Satan? Or does he see you as an ally? Well, I don't have to worry about that one. They claim to be sold out. But they do what they want to do. Sabbath is all about loyalty. It's about whether we're going to be loyal to God or loyal to Satan. There's no middle ground. If we fail to choose, then we choose Satan by default. Satan doesn't care if he gets you by choice or by lack of you choosing, just as long as he gets you. And so, who will you and I choose today? So today, saints, in closing, I just want to say this to you. I need your prayers. I'm an imperfect man serving in an imperfect world among imperfect people. But I serve a perfect God. Amen. But I need his help. 
I need his help to be the son that he's called me to be. To be. I need his help to be the husband he's called me to be. I need his help to maintain my body temple the way he's called me to. I need his help to be the father that he's called me to be, to be the supporter to Pastor Casey that he's called me to be. On my own, I'll be an overlord, a dictator, and yes, a boss. But with God's help, I can come along beside her and just like Aaron held up Moses' arms, I can be a supporter to you, Pastor. But I need Jesus. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say today that I guarantee you somebody else here probably needs Jesus' help too. Do I have anybody here that needs his help? Yeah. Let's pray together. Loving Father, I thank you that you are in the business of bearing long with your children. And Father, we can be some of the most stubborn, hard-headed, defiant creatures in existence. And Lord, sometimes, many times, too often, I am among them. Father, today we come to the altar. We come to the foot of the cross. And Lord, we're asking for your help. Lord, we're not looking to lay hands on people, pull their hair out. But Lord, if spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking, you need to do that to me, then Father, I give you full permission. Do whatever you have to do to save me. And Father, on behalf of my brothers and sisters, I ask that you might speak into their hearts just now as well. Father, we long to be restored. Daniel prayed for restoration. Father, we too need restoration. We know more spiritually and biblically than any generation in history. And yet, what are we doing with it? Father, Stir us to action. Stir us to be faithful in telling your truth. Father, may we never do it in a checkbox legalistic fashion. May we call people to the love of Jesus. May they see that love, that sacrifice, and want to live their lives for him. Father, let us never fall into the trap of just pointing fingers and judging others. Let us point to ourselves. Say, Father, please save me. I'm a sinner. So, Father, thank you for hearing our prayers today. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, thanks if you'll stand with me. We have our closing hymn. And I think our sister here, are you coming to lead it? No, 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 no. I want to get out of the way. I just want to make sure I'm following protocol. Thank you, Elder Bentley. And if we would, for time's sake, let's just do the first and last verses. Okay. Our closing hymn is number 602. Oh, brother, be faithful, the first and last verses only. Oh, mm-hmm.
And I want to be faithful. Saints, how about you? And of course it says, brother, be faithful. But we know that's inclusive. It includes our sisters too. Amen? Amen? So let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you that you have called us to faithfulness. And Lord, you don't just call us. You sustain us and you equip us. So Father, I know that I need your faithfulness. And it reminds me of the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Lord, we need your faithfulness because ours will never last. We cannot stand in the strength of our own flesh. So Lord, please forgive us where we have fallen. Forgive us where we perhaps have allowed your standards to fade or to fall into the dirt altogether. And Lord, let us never fall into legalism, but to always, every day, renew our love relationship with Jesus so that we put him first, that we put him best in everything. That he truly is not just our savior, the one whose blood we accept for forgiveness, but we also embrace him as Lord. Giving him, giving you, Lord, control over our lives. So, Father, as we leave this place and as we fellowship for a few moments, I pray that your blessing would be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, saints.